An 18-year-old student is back home on a break from school. Deirdre Jacob had left her Irish town to work as a student teacher in the UK. On July 28, 1998, Deirdre was getting ready to return to her job. She was running errands of visiting family. She was alone, but it was the middle of an afternoon in the town she grew up in. But Deirdre never made it back to her parents' home. Though she was last seen only about 350 feet away from their front door, her whereabouts have remained a mystery for over 20 years. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Deirdre Jacob. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again. Um, you know, we're a little late this week, but like we've got it's we've got stuff. It's fine. Everything's <laughs> everything's fine. I'm very excited this week though to tell our second overseas story. Oh yeah. So our first one was the Australian case of Eloise Whirlage. Right, right, right. And this one is out of Ireland. Exciting. Yeah. So, like, all of our cases, it's so weird, you know? Like, I just, uh, that's, I guess, why they go unsolved and why, you know, people cover them because they're so disturbing. For this one, so many people saw Deidre the day she went missing, Mm. literally minutes before she went missing, But it's been 23 years, and the case still hasn't officially been solved. Hmm. All right, so let's dig in. Let's just get right to it. Deirdre Jacob was born on October 14th, 1979, to Michael and Bernadette Jacob. She grew up in Newbridge, County Kildare, Ireland. Deirdre lived in Newbridge her entire life and had a younger sister, Ciara, who was about four years younger than she was. Newbridge is a pretty small town where everyone kind of knows everyone. It seems absolutely lovely uh, to us, you know. As is every Irish town. That, yeah, that you guys we should watch. want to go. Yes, you should see Ethan anytime we watch any show set in like Ireland or England. He's just like, oh, I want to move there. Can we move there? Let's go there. <laughs> it just looks awesome. Yeah, but. Deidre was a teenager. She's basically our same age. She was like a year older than we were. So we were growing up at the same time. And like any other teenager, she kind of thought her town sucked and wanted to move someplace cooler. Don't don't destroy the image of Ireland to me. I know, I know, I know. I I understand that it's, you know, just another town in or just another country in a part of the world. Yeah. I'm sure there's the same problems that exist <laughs> everywhere else. But in my mind, it's this peaceful little place yeah. with lush green hills, and we should just go and retire there. Yes, we should. But yeah, so Deirdre, though, you know, like many teenagers, had dreams of something bigger. When she graduated high school or secondary school, as it's called there, she decided she wanted to study to become a teacher. But she didn't want to stay super close to home in order to do that. She wanted to move to the big city. So Deirdre enrolled at St. Mary's University in London. Mm. Yeah. Even though Deirdre wanted to experience the freedom and independence that living in a big city allows, she still traveled back to Newbridge quite frequently and even worked in a school back there in order to gain more experience. And so, like, just, like, real quick, um, so she was described in a lot of articles as a student teacher. I feel like the the Irish, like, the European education system is so much more, it's just, it's a lot different from ours. And I feel like they, like, expect a lot more from people than we do. <laughs> because she was 18. 
So at oh. 18, we'd be like, um, if you could just wake up at some point and then go to a class ever, that would be great. <laughs> but like she was 18 and was fully a student teacher and was working at another school at home and just like doing everything. She's 18. That means she's like fresh out of high school. Yeah. yeah. No, this I mean, was like, her first I year. Not, I could not imagine, you know, a freshman in college in the U S doing something like that. Well, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. I just feel like they grow up faster and they just live their lives a little bit better and quicker than we do. This is why we got to go. <laughs> yeah. So when her first year of classes ended, she returned to her parents' home. Like, you know, again, that's a very common thing here too. You know, you finish your freshman year, summer comes, you go back home to your parents. So that's what Deirdre did. She went back to Newbridge and she went to her parents' home and lived there for the summer. In all of the articles I read, I couldn't find much information on how Deirdre spent that summer in Newbridge, but I mean, it sounds like it was just pretty low key. She hung out with her family, and the weekend before she went missing, she actually spent that weekend in Kirkman Cross, hanging out with some friends from college. Where, where was that again? Kirkman Cross. One more time. Nope, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody heard nope, you. Nope, 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 hard pass. Um, yeah, so she was there with some friends from college the weekend before. So, you know, like this is July, the end of July. So summer's winding down, but you've, you know, still got a couple more weeks to, to hang out. But it sounds like Deirdre was kind of getting into fall semester mode because on July 28th, which was a Tuesday, Deirdre wasn't doing anything terribly exciting. She walked into town basically to go run some errands. The walk from her family's home to the center of Newbridge took her about 25 minutes. And this was a journey that she had been making without incident for her entire life, like since she was a child, you know, because she lived in a small town, town in Ireland in the 80s and 90s. And like, you could just do that. You could just go walk into town. So she'd been doing that for a very long time. Yep, yeah, because it's like the land of fairies and hobbits. That's, <laughs> that's why. Because it's magical. We should move there. Yes. So that day, she was getting ready for the start of the new school year. She had found a place to live in London, but had to pay the deposit. Now, today, obviously, that would be done in about two minutes. She'd go online. There'd be a portal. She would pay the deposit. Bing, bang, boom, done. But this is 1998, so she had to go to a physical bank, mm -hmm. and it says she took a bank draft, which, you know, I don't know. It sounds Just like she with, got, like... Probably withdrew money. Well, yeah, I don't think she got cash, though. Um, I think she probably got, like, a cashier's check because oh, okay. she then went to the post office to mail it to a friend to, you know, pay the deposit. So I think she was mailing it to her friend who she was, she was supposed to be roommates with. Ah, okay. You know? Yeah. And then the friend, like, paid the deposit. So it sounds like, you know, bank, cashier's check, post office, deposit. Sure, sure. So she had to physically put it in the mail, like, with a stamp and an envelope and everything. Her grandmother actually owned a shop in town, so while she was out and about, Deidre stopped by and said hi to her. So we have a pretty detailed account of her whereabouts that afternoon, partially because many people who knew her saw her, mm -hmm. and also partially because we have a surprising amount of surveillance footage for a small town in 1998. 1998, yeah. Yeah, That's... and it's like actually good quality. Like I've seen some of the footage online and we'll post on the blog and I've seen some of the stills and you like you can actually tell it's her. So that's crazy because like so often in these cases they're in a place where there should be surveillance footage. Yeah, they're never But the is. cameras are broken yeah, or, or, or the, the footage <laughs> is so grainy you can't see anything. Exactly. But for whatever reason in Newbridge County Kildare, Ireland, in 1998, there was like really good surveillance 
footage. Maybe they had like a really nice radio shack in town. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I have no idea. But yeah, it's it's really impressive. Like you can actually just see her. And the last known image of Deidre is her waiting in line at the post office at 2.26 p.m. So after she went to the post office, mailed the check, did her business, she started the walk back home. There were a couple of different routes she could have taken. Because again, it was a 25-minute walk, which to me is close to two miles, maybe about a mile and a half, mm-hmm. give or take. And there were apparently several ways she could have gone. But it, from what I've read, it sounds like regardless, like there were several ways she could have gone until she got to like this one street. And either way, she had to end up on that street. And several people saw her on that street. So her exact route doesn't really matter. Because so you said people saw her on at the basically at the choke point of these yes. several routes. Yes. Okay. So that was after two twenty eight when Correct. she was seen on those surveillance. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So her like entire point A to point B route doesn't really matter. Right. It's more of the like point A point five <laughs> to point B route. You right. know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When she was on that last street, she was seen by eight different people six of whom knew her. Okay, so it wasn't a, a case of mistaken identity. No. I mean, unless it was like some mass psychosis <laughs> hey, yeah. in the town or yeah. something. Like, a lot of people saw her. And that's what really struck me about this case. She was seen by so many people. A man on a bike, a man fixing his roof, like people who were also out walking and said hello to her. Nearly every step she took was accounted for. In fact, the last person to report seeing the teenager said that he saw her at the gate to her home. Hmm. Do we have a rough estimate of time? Yeah, it's right around 3 p.m. So again, the timeline completely matches up. Yeah. Now, I don't think this person actually knew Deidre, but he remembered the bag she was wearing It was a black messenger bag because we loved a messenger bag in the 90s. Very true. And it had a bright yellow cat logo, meaning Caterpillar, like the bulldozer company. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, because we also loved being ironic farmers in the 90s. I don't know if that That, reached up to Pittsburgh. Definitely did not reach Pittsburgh. Because like here, I remember a lot of people... Like, I don't remember anybody having that specific messenger bag, but I do remember things with, like, the cat logo on it as, like, a fashion accessory. Was was it ironic because you were in the middle of farmland? I mean, kind of, but also, yeah, because also around here, people would wear, like, Carhartt uh, pants and, like, jackets and stuff. Yeah, no. Yeah. That that wasn't. Well, so Carhartt pants down here was a big thing with the skaters. Because they were really big and baggy. And so like a lot of the skaters down here would wear them. Yeah. I mean, we were wearing Jenkos. Well, so were we. Like that was a thing too. I, yeah. But the, like here it was kind of both. Huh. It was a lot. I mean, we did. We, we contained we had, multitudes. We had, we, had, we, had, <laughs> we had carpenter pants. We wore well, carpenter yeah, but, pants. But car, and Carhartts are like for real legit carpenter pants. Yeah. So we, we were, I guess, a little more authentic than you were. Um, maybe <laughs> you guys had a little bit more money than we did. Um, I don't know about all that. Mm. But in any case, so it, it was a very memorable bag because it's not like everybody had one of these, you know? Mm-hmm. It was a trend, but it wasn't ubiquitous. The, the, the bag was not as as trendy. No, absolutely yeah. not. And it, it was still a black bag with a bright yellow logo, and that's noticeable. Yeah. Deidre basically made it to her house. She was just steps away from her driveway when she seemingly vanished into thin air. Because Deidre was 18 and home for the summer, no one in her family realized she was missing right away. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't until that evening around 7 p.m. when she still wasn't home that her parents thought something might be wrong and called the guard eye. Police seemed to take the disappearance pretty seriously, despite the fact that Deirdre was technically an adult. They got right to work looking for her. 
And when she still hadn't been found by July 31st, a nationwide appeal was made for information leading to her location and return. So keep in mind, she went missing on July 28th. By August 2nd, the Gardai were searching local bogs, fields, and riverbanks, but found no sign of the young woman. Ireland's relatively like a pretty small country, so they don't have a ton of missing people. So Deirdre's case got a lot of media attention. I'm, I'm assuming that the police looked into her parents. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly couldn't find any articles that explicitly said that. Yeah, but, or I mean, gave the parents location. Yeah, n- oddly enough, none that, of the articles I read like went into that at all. Diff- different, uh, different reporting over there. I yeah, suppose. I think so. I think that's really more what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, then like they didn't look at the parents because a parent could never do that. I don't, I don't yeah, necessarily no, sure, think I'm, that's yeah, what I'm was sure, happening. I'm sure the police looked into it, but yeah, uh, but the, yeah, the the media outlets over there probably didn't investigate that or didn't think that was necessarily relevant, relevant or yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, so maybe the news media over there actually respects the privacy of individuals. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. In any case, I didn't read anything about them looking into any members of the family or treating this like a non stranger abduction at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the media, it, it, they got really interested and it quickly turned into a frenzy when media began to speculate that Deidre's disappearance may not have been an isolated incident. Oh. They were asking, could she be a victim of Ireland's vanishing triangle? Ireland's Vanishing Triangle refers to a group of Irish women who all disappeared in the mid to late 90s. Most of the women, there are eight in all, were in their late teens to early 20s. And they all went missing suddenly from the eastern side of the country. Huh. Never heard about this. Yeah, I hadn't heard about it either until I started researching this case. But these women... Annie McCarrick, Fiona Pender, Ciara Breen, Jojo Dullard, Fiona Sanat, Ava Brennan, Imelda Keenan, and Deidre have never been seen again. Hmm. While the circumstances of several of these disappearances are similar, the common thought is that not all of them were necessarily perpetrated by the same person, Though, police do believe that at least some of the cases are connected. Like, nobody thinks that eight different men came and attacked and abducted slash murdered eight different women sure. on the eastern side of Ireland. Yeah. For instance, Fiona Sinat was the 19-year-old woman who disappeared in February of 1998, just a few months before Deirdre. She was last seen leaving a pub with her ex-boyfriend, who was also the father of her 11-month-old daughter. He claims that he slept on the couch at her home that night, and she left the next morning to go to the doctor because she was having, like, arm pain or something. But she was never seen again. And police, when they got involved, could never locate any evidence that she ever went to the doctor or did anything of the sort. And when Gardai examined her home, they found that it had been stripped of many of her personal belongings. A nearby farmer later found trash bags with many of those belongings belonging to Fiona, but she was never seen again. In that case, the ex-boyfriend is the primary suspect, and it seems to be a domestic incident, ultimately unrelated to the other cases. But, I mean, without a body, the truth of what happened to Fiona has been difficult to prove. Right. So, you know, like all of these other cases, it's still unsolved. Mm -hmm. She still hasn't been found, and nobody has been arrested. But Jojo Dullard is a different story. 
Jojo was a 21-year-old woman who was living in Dublin. She was from nearby Colan, which is in County Kilkenny. She had recently dropped out of school and was planning on moving back home to kind of, you know, regroup and figure out her life a little bit. When she missed her bus to go home, she ended up taking a different one part way and then hitchhiked from there. At 11.37 p.m. on November 9th, 1995, she made a call at a payphone to her friend Mary Cullinan. She ended the call when a car came up to her and stopped. It was presumed that the person inside offered her a ride because Mm -hmm. she had been hitchhiking, but she was never seen again. At the time, Jojo was considered to be the last victim in the Vanishing Triangle, but when Deirdre went missing, that came into question because the place where Jojo made that last call, it was in a village called Moon in County Kildare, only about 30 miles from where Deirdre would disappear less than three years later. Mm -hmm. So the search for Deirdre continued, but no one could understand what had happened to the woman who seemingly vanished into thin air right in front of her house in the middle of the day. Had someone followed her? Was someone waiting there for her? Did someone in a car come up and abduct her? Like, Anything really seemed possible, but there were no clues that led police one way or the other. They interviewed the whole town, basically, and while many people saw Deirdre that day, no one noticed anything odd. And as far as I know, like there's no shady ex-boyfriend or anyone else who Deirdre had been having problems with. She was seemingly a completely average 18-year-old living a completely average life. Police renewed their appeal for information on September 7th as investigative avenues began to be exhausted. Deirdre's mother, Bernadette, pleaded for people to come forward if they had seen her daughter. And on September 28th, someone did. A man called into a radio station and said that not only had he seen Deidre that day, but he had given her a ride. Oh. He said that he picked her up a few miles from her home and that she seemed agitated. He then drove her three hours away to Kirkma Cross in County Monaghan. Now, if the name Kirkma Cross sounds familiar, it's because I mentioned it earlier in the episode. That's where Deidre was the weekend before she disappeared. Hmm. So given that, her parents thought this tip may be just what they had been waiting for. Sure. But I find it interesting that so many people saw Deidre and this person claimed to see to have picked her up like several miles past her house. Right. But nobody else says that they saw her go past her house at all. Yeah, and he claims that she was irritated or agitated. Agitated, yeah. By what? Yeah, well, who knows? Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, are we assuming that her parents were in the house? No, I don't think they were home. Okay. So maybe she did make it into the house and maybe got a phone call? I, I mean, I don't know. I would have assumed they would have checked all the phone records, you know, and nothing about a phone call was ever said. I mean, there could have been like maybe her parents weren't home, but she did have a 14 year old sister. Mm. So she could have been home, you know, but there's never been anything that indicated she ever made it past the driveway right. of their house. Yeah. And 97, Eight. 98, unlikely that she had a cell phone. It, no, could, it doesn't could, sound could like a, could be possible. Yeah, but it does not unlikely. sound like she had a cell phone. I'm just I'm just wondering, like, okay, if she made it to her house to, or to the gate to mm-hmm. her house, you know, what would cause her to get agitated and leave? Well, right, because again, a million people saw her, and she was like doing very boring things. Right. She was going to the bank. She was going to the post office. Yeah, I don't think she had a cell phone. So what could have happened that would have caused her to walk several miles past her house and Mm -hmm. then hitch a ride with a stranger? 
But, you know, regardless, because he did mention Crick McCross, where Deidre had actually been, her parents were like, well, this sounds like it could be something. So they begged the anonymous caller to come forward and give them more information, but he didn't. Instead, he made many other calls to Gardai, to newspapers. He even wrote Bernadette and Michael a four-page letter. For months, Gardai investigated, and the Jacob family made pleas for this man to come forward. They traveled up to the Crook Macross area and posted flyers everywhere, you know, hoping that maybe somebody had seen her if she had been driven there. You know, they were just hoping for new witnesses or new clues or just something. But months passed and the man still wouldn't identify himself. Yeah, I, I mean, at this point, I, I'm getting the feeling that this is a mental health consumer who's in, inserting himself into an investigation for not necessarily notoriety, mm -hmm. but because there's some sort of mental disorder that's leading him to to do this. We, we talked about this before. That th right. This is a common thing in, in widely publicized, well-known cases that you get these calls from people that have nothing to do with it, uh, you know, and they, they just want to stir the pot for mm -hmm. whatever reason. And the police have to investigate them, obviously. Well, yeah, claim. especially because like I said, I mean, th he said things that sure. seemed legit. Sure, but we also don't know the level of reporting. Perhaps he saw, maybe there was a, a news report somewhere about her, the timeline of what she was doing yeah. the weekend before, and he picked up on that clue about Crick Macross and included that to make it seem as though he was legit. Yeah, I, I actually don't know the answer to that piece of it. He contacted the family in September. Some reports I read said that he even contacted Gardai 10 days after, um, after Dieter's disappearance. Mm. It was just not until the end of September that he made this call to the radio station. So he had been doing this for a while. And by January of the next year, of 1999, like he was still doing this, like he was still making calls, he was still sending letters and not saying who he was or giving any more yeah, that, information. That's a problem for me. I mean, like, so that if if this was somebody that that legitimately interacted or had this interaction with mm -hmm. her, and he's so persistent about it, why why is he failing to come forward? Right, and you know? I think after several months, that's what Guard I were wondering too. So they're like, you know what? If you're not going to come forward, like we're just going to figure this out. So they decided to play one of the man's calls, which they had recorded on RTE's Midday News. Within minutes, he was identified. And like he said, it was determined that it was all a hoax. There you go. Yeah, he had recently suffered his own personal tragedy and for whatever reason that led him to want to insert himself into this tragedy. Yeah. I know that we're coming to expect it, but I still, I still find it shocking how often something like this happens in these cases. It's disturbing. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's disturbing and upsetting to the, to the investigators also, even, even though those of us in law enforcement are familiar with it, it if you're investigating something like this, like you still have a, a somewhat of a personal stake. Well, of course. And getting misled by, by this, you know, for no seeming reason, like it pisses you off. Yeah. So, yeah. It was, and the parents too were devastated, I'm sure, you yeah. know, because they thought that they had an avenue to getting answers and it turned out that they didn't. And they were right back where they started, which was basically nowhere. Yeah. So this obviously brought the perceived momentum in Deirdre's case to a screeching halt. But after this, there was a new appeal for information, but this one wasn't from police. Remember, we're in Ireland. So it was from the church. Mm. 
priests around the country urged their members to come to them if they had any information on the missing woman, if they didn't feel comfortable going to police. All right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how like helpful that ultimately would have been because uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, that that kind of testimony wouldn't stand up in court here. I don't know <laughs> the proceedings <sighs> yeah. over there, but but in any case, it didn't seem like it created any new movement in the case. But like I said, uh, this case really did get a lot of attention. And again, there were just pleas for new information constantly from many different avenues. Like the other woman in Ireland's Vanishing Triangle, Deirdre's case ultimately went cold, even as a reward for information climbed to 100 thousand pounds. Wow. Throughout the years, Michael and Bernadette stayed in the public eye, periodically making fresh appeals for someone, anyone to come forward with information in their daughter's case. While there were rumors flying around and definitely things happening behind the scenes in the investigation, no real news would come out about Deidre until 2018 the 20th anniversary of her disappearance. That year, Gardai upgraded Deidre's case from a missing persons case to a murder. And this was primarily based on an alleged confession. According to an article in the Irish Times, quote, the new information has satisfied the Garda beyond doubt that Miss Jacob was murdered rather than, for example, being killed accidentally and her remains disposed of, end quote. They also named a person of interest, Larry Murphy. Larry Murphy was a name that had been bandied about in relation to the Vanishing Triangle for several years by that point. Murphy was a contractor who lived in Baltingloss in County Wicklow, which is within the area of the Triangle. Okay. In 2001, Murphy was convicted of abducting, repeatedly raping, and attempting to murder a woman in the Wicklow Mountains in 2000. Hmm. He was interrupted during the crime by a pair of hunters and was later apprehended, which is the only reason the woman survived. Hmm. He ended up serving 10 years of a 15-year sentence and was released in 2010. Remind me again, uh, time frame of the the triangle uh, when, when these women went missing. Yeah, so the very first woman went missing in 1993. Okay. And Deirdre went missing in 1998. Right. Larry Murphy committed this crime in 2000. Okay. And then went to prison in 2001. Okay. And then, but and then got out in 2010. Presumably, it stopped when he went to prison. The, there were no other missing persons associated with this triangle. Yeah, no. Deirdre is still considered to be the last, the last. victim. Okay. Um, there was one other woman who was mentioned as a possible victim after Deirdre. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say in like 2012, but it was determined that she was murdered. Uh, like they found who she, who killed her. I don't. I think it was her husband or boyfriend or something like that. Okay. But they found who killed her. So. As of now, Deidre is considered to be the last victim. I'd be curious about the escalation and and how how many did you say? I, I know you, you in the Vanishing Triangle. Yeah, eight. So eight total from, from ninety three to ninety eight. Although the first one in ninety three, maybe or maybe not be. No, no, no. Ninety three, they do believe it okay. was. It, yeah, it was like another one in the middle in ninety five. Okay. who they think may not be. There are actually a couple who they think might not have been related, but they were in the middle. Okay. So they do think several of them are connected, including the first, the last, and a few in the middle. Okay. So you're talking about a span of five years. Yeah. There. And And Larry Murphy would have been like in his 30s. 
Right. And then the last attempt was uh, 2000, 2001. The one, the one where he got caught. Yeah, two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah. I mean, it's cer- it's certainly possible. Um, yeah. You know, serial rapists, serial killers. We've seen historically, will commit you know these acts either in spurts or the longer they go with getting away with it, and if if unless there's a significant change in in their life, it just mm-hmm. progresses to more and more violence or or uh, more and more victims. So it, it's certainly plausible. Well, it especially is interesting that he he would be in that area. Yeah, and he was, and it is interesting that you bring up a change in their life because at the time of the 2000 crime mm-hmm. for which he was arrested, Larry Murphy was married and his wife was pregnant. Mm. And initially she supported him. Because she was like, well, this is insane. My husband never would have done something like this. Right. But after his arrest and, you know, when they're getting ready, when they're going through the whole process, he basically realized that they had him dead to rights. And so he ended up pleading guilty, Mm. at which point his wife was like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like, I'm out. And apparently, to my knowledge, Larry has never met his child. Do you know how long they were married? I don't. At, at that point. I don't know or, anything else about, about it. Okay. Just that they, he was married and she was pregnant at the time and then left him once he was convicted. Sure. sure. I'm just wondering if the if the the marriage was closer to 98. Yeah. Which is what stopped his progression at least momentarily. Mm-hmm. And then perhaps the physical or the 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 stressors of having a child on the way kind of pushed him back into what he was known for. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. Um, yeah. But that's interesting. Yeah. So his name appeared in relation to both Deirdre and Jojo Dullard's case shortly after his release in 2010. I found an article that was published right after that. And apparently the spot where he first attacked his victim, who he later took to the Wicklow Mountains, the one in 2000, was very near the area where Jojo was last seen. Murphy was also working as a carpenter in Deirdre's area at the time of her disappearance. But not only that, it's alleged that he also did some work at her grandmother's shop. Oh, so perhaps he followed her from the grandma's shop. Maybe. His name and number were found among her things after her death, the grandmother's. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like when he was there, it might have been a couple of years before Deidre's disappearance. So Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Like there are conflicting things about where he was. Specifically and at when the time, exactly, yeah. but it, but yeah, it's it's still evidence that links him exactly, and exactly. Like I said, I don't believe in coincidences, <laughs> except for when you do, except for when I do. So this was 2010 when he was released. Mm-hmm. The next year, in 2011, an ex cellmate of Murphy's told police that Murphy had confessed to him. Okay. Yeah, I know. He told Detective Alan Bailey, now retired, who was the detective on Deirdre's case at the time, that while he and Murphy were drinking hooch and doing drugs inside the prison, that Murphy told him that, quote, he had pulled in alongside a young girl on the road just outside of Newbridge, waved the map in her direction, and asked for instructions on getting to a particular place. When the youngster leaned in through the open passenger window to try to see where he was pointing to, he is alleged to have grabbed her by her hair and roughly dragged her down into the car, forcing her down into the well of the front passenger seat. End quote. Murphy then sped off. And it should be noted at this time that Deidre was small. She was only about five foot two and I was apparently of slim build. Okay. So physically, like that sounds extremely possible. Yeah. Um I, I'm curious what the uh what the cellmate is getting out of 
this. Oh yeah, of course. You know, uh, yeah. I get that they were drinking hooch or whatever yeah. and doing drugs, but like what, what sense would it make for him to confess to more than what he's already pled guilty to, you know, even, even to somebody in prison. Right. Like, no, you're right. And I, I never like these like jailhouse snitches, no. regardless of how plausible the story might sound on the surface. And to their credit, police took this, but they didn't like go, okay, let's go get them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're like, yeah, we can't rest a case on, on, that. on that. Yeah. Right. Right. But what this information did lead to were searches in County Wicklow. Yeah. You know, where Murphy lived at the time. But police didn't turn anything up. So after police didn't turn anything up from the search, they actually didn't make this confession public for another seven years. Detectives who, by 2018, had already interviewed 2,000 people in relation to Deidre's case, began to re-interview builders and tradesmen who may have encountered Murphy in the summer of 1998. Because, again, he was working as a contractor. Yeah, no, that's smart. Yeah. This case actually went through an entire, like, 12-month cold case review mm -hmm. around this time where they just, again, started from the beginning and looked at everything that they had. And one of the things that they did during this time was they took that CCTV footage, which is already good, and enhanced it mm -hmm. um, and kind of cleaned it up a little bit so that, and, you know, they didn't see anything. They're like, oh, wait, there she is being abducted. It was anything like that. But what they were able to do was identify more people from the video. Right. Yeah. Who were around Deirdre mm -hmm. and then interview or re-interview them. Right. So they were doing that and Gardai continued to work methodically to build a case against Larry Murphy. Like, yes, they learned about this alleged confession in 2011, but you know, like I said, that's not enough to arrest, much less convict anybody of anything, really. Right. So they trudged along while Larry Murphy continued to live as a free man. Yeah, and I'm sure that they were watching him. I'm really glad that you brought that up because this will lead us into the little side path that I wanted to take. Okay. Uh, that it's something I know you will find very interesting because, as we've mentioned on here before, I think your father worked in state parole, mm -hmm. and you grew up with stories from him about men like Larry Murphy, mm -hmm. who he had to deal with. Yes. So you will love this article that I found from the Herald that was written shortly after his release from prison in 2010. Okay. Okay. But I want to preface this. Because it took me several paragraphs to get to this. So I just want to like move it up and not bury the lead, which is Murphy was being watched, like you just said. So the article said that he was, quote, being monitored by the Garda's National Surveillance Unit with plainclothes officers following him. He carries a mobile phone and reports to Garda daily, end quote. All right. But, like I said, that was buried, like, way down in this article. And this is how the article started. And I'm just going to read the first several paragraphs. And, again, the whole thing is linked on our blog because this is absolutely mind-boggling coming from an American perspective in general and especially from your perspective as somebody who, like, grew up with a state parole officer in your house. Quote, Rapist Larry Murphy is in secure accommodation today after finally agreeing to consider undertaking counseling. His involvement with the probation service will be voluntary and comes about as a result of the widespread hostile reaction he encountered since being turned loose from prison on Thursday last. Although he snubbed all previous offers of treatment, he came to realize that he needed help from probation officers in getting accommodation. In return, he agreed to voluntarily keep in touch with them and consider using other support services, such as counseling. 
there would be nothing to prevent him from opting out of contact with the probation service at a later date. End quote. <laughs> <laughs> what is the point of a probation officer over there if if everything has to be voluntary? <laughs> I don't know. To like help him find a place to live, apparently. I'm so confused by that. Yeah. Like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I, I mean, here stateside, like you don't have a choice. Yeah, that's like that's the part, conditions that's part of, of your release. Yes, that's part of your sentence. Yeah, the, the terminology and the the about things varies per state as yeah, far as course. probation, parole, parole and what yeah, all yeah. that means or mm-hmm. whatever. But like, so the way Pennsylvania is set up is that let's say you get five to ten, mm-hmm. right? So you really serve the entire ten years. You right. serve the first five in jail, and then you're eligible for parole, right? Mm-hmm. Let's say you are paroled. Well, you have to serve the rest of your five years, the rest of your 10 years. The next five yeah. years, you're on parole. So you're still serving your sentence. You're just doing it outside of prison. Correct. And, yeah. you, have, and you have limited civil rights. Right. There is no Fourth Amendment mm-hmm. <laughs> in your world if, if you are this person. Uh, you know, your parole agent can come and search your house, where you work, uh, your car, at any time. Right. With no reason whatsoever. Yeah, they don't need probable cause. No, nothing. Yeah. They don't even need reasonable suspicion. Yeah. It's just, hey, it's a Tuesday. I come and toss your house every Tuesday mm-hmm. because you pissed me off, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, and there are other factors that go into that. Like, they can't be used as, as an agent of the state to find something else to charge them with Mm -hmm. like the 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 parole agent has to be searching them searching their house for let's say if it was a drug conviction for drugs yeah that kind of thing regardless like you know you still you you still spend all that time serving your sentence just in a different capacity i don't understand why there would even be probation officers if it would be voluntary yeah, I don't know. I find it interesting, and I don't really want to comment one yeah, way or the other, sure. just because we know nothing about the Irish ju- judicial system. You're right, and I so don't. we'll just like sound like dumb Americans or whatever. And they're we, like, "No, actually, this we is probably genius already and do. whatever." Well, yeah, I'm sure we do, and also like America's incarceration rates are fucking sure. stupid, yeah. and. I mean, listen, we obviously who, cannot who are be we to judge. Exactly. Yes. Because like we have the we live in the worst country in the world when it comes to shit so like this. Incarceration rates, especially, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So whatever. But I just did find that interesting and I knew you would like <laughs> yeah. get a kick out of that. <laughs> well, and another reason to maybe not like turn our nose up at this is that as far as I know, Murphy has stayed out of trouble since his release. As far as we know, yeah. Well, exactly. So, like, he's never been caught for anything else. He's never gone back to jail. He's never, you know, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, But, yeah, and that was over a decade ago. He is also believed to be currently living in London. Since his name was officially given as the chief suspect in 2018, Gardai have inched closer and closer to making an arrest. In 2020, the case was turned over to the director of public prosecutions who are gathering everything they needed to make that arrest. While the DPP said that they believed Murphy to be in London, witnesses reported that they saw him in Ireland at a Garda COVID checkpoint. The Irish Times reported that Murphy had female clothing, a mattress, and pillows in the back of his van. He is apparently homeless and living back in Ireland, at least about a year ago in 2020. Mm, so maybe they're not watching him quite so closely anymore. Yeah, that's that's kind of what it sounds like. Mm. But again, that all of that is kind of unconfirmed. In February of 2021, the DPP confirmed that they were still working on the case with a high-ranking official telling the Independent, quote, We haven't forgotten about Larry Murphy. The DPP has been considering a case against our chief suspect for exactly one year. No news is good news. The longer the Garda evidence is considered, the better a signal this is for investigators, as all aspects of the case are being fully considered. End quote. 
So, I mean, they're really taking their time and like crossing all their T's and dotting all their I's on this one. Yeah. Sounds like it. And right now in 2021, that's where we still are on the precipice of an arrest. The last article that I found on this was just from a few weeks ago on August 9th in the Sunday World, and it was revealed that the DPP has sent the file to a specialty barrister for a second opinion to ensure that they have enough evidence to prosecute. And the article said that charges could come within weeks. So like literally at this point, any minute. Murphy is also a suspect in the disappearance of Jojo Dullard, who I mentioned earlier. Her case was also upgraded to a murder investigation in October of last year. Murphy is also suspected in the disappearance of another vanishing triangle case, that of Annie McCarrick, the first woman to disappear. She was a 27-year-old who had moved from Long Island, New York to Dublin in 1987. In 1993, she decided to take a day trip to the Wicklow Mountains. She never made it back home. We will keep you updated on any new developments, but let's hope that 2021 is going to be the year that Deirdre sees justice and that this opens the door for families to finally have answers about what happened to their loved ones in the Vanishing Triangle. Jacob has been missing since July 28, 1998. She was five foot two and was wearing a blue t-shirt with white shoes and was carrying a black bag with a yellow Caterpillar Inc. logo at the time of her disappearance. Deidre was 18 years old when she disappeared. She would be 41 today. If you have any information on Deidre Jacob's disappearance, please contact the Newbridge Guard Eye at 353-454- 31212. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we are actually going to be out of town next week. So we are unfortunately going to have to take another break. So we will not have a new episode next week, but we will see you here the week after that for a brand new episode. See you then. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And then they were gone is a little monster production. Hey, you can do it.